Hello, this is a quick video on atomic structure for GCSE physics. Now we're all quite used to these days an uh, atom that looks something like that with a small positive nucleus in the centre and electrons orbiting around. But that wasn't always the accepted view. This is actually what we now know as the Bohr model of the atom. Uh, a long time ago, in 1890-ish, uh, there was this model of the atom. This was called the Plum Pudding model. Just like a pudding, I think people these days might prefer to think of it as the, um, the muffin model. It was like an atom had a positive kind of cake in which there were these small things which could be knocked off called electrons which were the negatively charged part of the atom so they knew a lot of the same things that we know about atoms they knew they were overall neutral they knew that there was a small thing called an electron that could come off at any point and this is an experiment that you'll need to be aware of done by Ernest Rutherford and so we call this Rutherford scattering or sometimes alpha particle scattering because what Rutherford did was he took a very thin gold leaf, okay, AU, symbol for gold, uh, and he fired some alpha particles at it. You know, the alpha particles in red because they're a small positive charge. We'll, there'll be another video soon to tell you a bit more about what alpha particles are. He noticed, first thing he noticed when he fired the alpha particles at his gold leaf, is most of them went straight through. So, okay, and he detected them over here with his detector. Um, so most particles went straight through, and his conclusion was that well, well, the atoms that he was firing at in the gold were actually mostly empty space. The atoms were actually mostly nothing at all, and this amazed him. Then he he moved his detector around, so he moved it to these positions, and up here as well. And he noticed that some particles, not very many, were being deflected through small angles. So some, not anywhere near as many. We're talking the thousands this way for only about ten or twenty of these ways. Okay, some particles. were deflected. Now given that he's seen this and he still hasn't accounted for all of these particles, he was quite amazed when he moved his detector around to this side and he saw that very, very, very few actually were deflected through very large angles and back the direction they came. I should say few particles. Are deflected through large angles. And his two conclusions for this was that firstly there must be a very small concentration of mass somewhere in the atom. And that it must be that concentration of mass must be a positive charge because it repelled the uh, positive alpha particle and he coined the term nucleus which means a kernel at the center of something so actually that disproved what was the accepted model the plum pudding model where the mass is all evenly uh, distributed throughout the atom Okay, and uh, the only mobile bits, the only bits that could change were the electrons. So that gives us our model that we now accept. And you need to know the three particles in the atom. The first one is the proton. Its mass is one, one relative atomic mass from your chemistry. And its charge is a positive charge, a positive charge of one. You need to know about the neutron, normally drawn as a little green circle. And you need to know its mass is also one, it's the same as a proton, 
but its charge is zero. It has no charge. It is neutral. Okay, and lastly, the little green, the little blue dot that I've drawn there is the electron, which has basically no mass, and you'll see in some textbooks zero, but I like to tell you because it is interesting. It's got mass. It's a very, very small mass. It's one eighteen hundredth the mass of a proton. It has a negative charge. You need to know as well how we're going to use the period table in nuclear physics. You need to know what the numbers mean. In chemistry, they call that the atomic number. Lithium is number three in the period table. In physics, let's call it the proton number. Because it tells us literally the number of protons. The lithium in its nucleus has three protons. Okay, oh, this happens to be lithium that I've drawn over here. So, how many neutrons does it have? Well, this is its mass number. Okay. And that's how you use it in chemistry as well. But here in physics, we need to think that is the total protons and neutrons. So, we call it the nucleon number. So, if there are seven protons plus neutrons, well, how many neutrons must there be? That's easy. Seven take away three is four. And when it exists in an atom with no charge, you can see that the charge must be equal. So the number of protons must equal the number of electrons. The neutrons don't play any part in the charge. So how many electrons have it got? Well, it's got three. Let's do this for radium as well. Yeah, radium was one of the first radioactive particles to be discovered. Num number of protons? Well, that's just the proton number, 88. Number of neutrons? Well, I'm not going to attempt to do that in my head is this, take away that, 226, take away 88, gives me 138. Okay, so simply think about that as being protons plus neutrons, and you always got to work out the number of neutrons. How many electrons? Well, equal to the proton number, that's easy. It's more important for chemistry. Here's one of the main other radioactive uh, elements that we'll be talking about. Proton number, how many there? 92. Okay, 238, oh, got that wrong, 238, take away 92 gives me 146 neutrons. Number of electrons, if it's an atom, is equal to the number of protons. So, well, what happens then when uh, we lose or we gain electrons? Now, again, that's something important for uh, chemistry as well as this part of physics. When any radioactive uh, particle hits an atom, it can do some damage to that atom, and we call that ionization. Okay, so ionization. Ionization is either losing an electron, in which case now you've got three positives and only two negatives. Okay, so that leaves the overall charge as a positive ion. Or if it gains an electron, you'll end up with four electrons, so four negative and only three positive. And so you'll have a negative ion. More important for chemistry, but you just need to know physics. Changing the atomic structure, changing the number of electrons is what we call ionization. Last little bit then here. This is the idea of different isotopes. Now remember from your chemistry that the number the, the uh, proton number or the atomic number is the thing which determines which element it is. So carbon is always number six. Carbon always has six protons. And in the chemical period table, they always give you the, the average uh, atomic mass because carbon can have different numbers of neutrons. In this, the, the most abundant carbon, there's six protons and 12 take away six neutrons so six neutrons and six el electrons to balance it out. Um, but this is only one isotope of carbon. This is carbon 12, okay? Where you've got one, two, three, four, five, six protons, six neutrons as well. But actually, there exists some carbon 13. So how many neutrons are in carbon-13? Well, there must be six protons, otherwise it wouldn't be carbon. So there must be seven neutrons. 
And here, the third isotope of carbon, the first third common isotope of carbon, I should say, carbon 14, six protons, but eight neutrons. And this is interesting because, well, this is radioactive carbon. We'll look at, when we talk about half life, we'll look at why we use the radioactive carbon. So, just a little bit about notation. We can write different isotopes in this manner, okay, but for short, we might write C12 or C13 uh, uh, or C14. But also, we actually write the symbol C and we include all the information from the pivot table here. So, carbon 12, we put the proton number at the bottom, the number of proton numbers at the bottom behind it, and 12, the mass number at the top. Don't get confused within chemistry when you use a small subscript letter afterwards to indicate how many of the atom you've got in a formula. And here, carbon 13, we'll look at 6 at the bottom because the proton number doesn't change if it's carbon. 13 at the top. Similarly with carbon 14, 6 at the bottom, 14 at the top. So you don't need to use a, a period table in physics in general, but you do need to be able to interpret the numbers if they're given to you like this or like this. Okay, thanks for listening. I hope that helped.